Great. So uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, again, it's a delight to have you here on our campus. Um, there has been so much moving so quickly uh, in AI. Uh, it is it is absolutely mesmerizing, um, and you've been at the uh, you know the front seat of a lot of this change. Um, one of the questions that, uh, as an institution that's committed to social justice, to ethics, uh, to responsibility, and, and we're an institution that believes we have a, a strong place uh, in the future of AI. One of the questions we'd like to ask is, how can we ensure, in, with, with so much happening so quickly, the ethical considerations are prioritized? Uh, and what role should industry leaders, such as yourself and some of your colleagues, what role should, should leaders play uh, in, in making sure that we have responsible practices? You know, the, the way that I like to talk about this is to say that artificial intelligence can be the greatest technological revolution, the greatest new tool, the greatest engine for economic growth the world has had, but it's a can, not a will. The, the technology clearly is amazing, but to get deployed well, it'll take the partnership and integration with all of society and making sure that this is done in uh, an equitable way that lifts everybody up. And the technology actually lends itself, I think, quite well to that, um, but we can't do it on our own. And so figuring out, uh, one of the reasons that we love to come talk to people outside of Silicon Valley and do trips around the world and visit universities um, and talk to people from very different backgrounds, different industries, very different goals for what they'd like AI to do is ChatGPT is now a very widely used product. It's got to serve a lot of people, and it's got to do that in an inclusive way, uh, a fair way, and in a way that sort of brings the best of this technology to, to everyone. There are a lot of very difficult questions. Um, when, when we had the first GPTs trained, this is back in the you know, GPT-1 in two days, we looked at that and we said, well, we can train this great thing, but you train something on the internet, you've got a very biased system. Um, what's it going to take to address that, to remedy that. And at the time, we had some ideas. One of them, called reinforcement learning from human feedback, worked way better than we thought it was going to, to, uh, I won't say de-bias a system, because I, I kind of believe no two people ever agree that any one system can be de-biased, but to give us tools to significantly impact the behavior of a system. And if you look at how GPT-4 does on any bias test you'd like to throw at it, um, versus earlier versions. We've, we've clearly made a lot of progress. But now we're at the even harder question, um, which is who decides what the behavior of these systems should be? What does that process look like? How do you get democratic input from the whole world for a system that's going to impact the whole world? How do you make sure that marginalized voices that don't always get heard are heard loudly? And and not only like what is the default behavior of the system, but how much is someone allowed to push it here? How do you make sure that users giving the input about their own value preferences are taking into account this broader picture of the world. And um, for that, we need a lot of collaboration. Uh, we're launching some new stuff next week about democratic inputs. But we're very excited that the technology allows this, and now we get to face the harder societal problem of making sure it happens. Well, thank you. I'm going to pass it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Sutherland. Sure, sure. Uh, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that uh, I've, I've had conversation with colleagues about is, is that um, to what impact do you feel of having marginalized input at the development stage at, at, when you're developing aspects of AI uh, or, or chat GPT? If, 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 if that, at that level you had you know, uh, diversity at, at that level, how much would that contribute to, to uh, addressing some of the bias issues? Uh, critical, um, both at the level of people uh, you know, do it, coming up with the, the engineering ideas, also making sure that the people who are uh, writing the specifications of how the system should behave, and then the people who are um, answering the questions, providing that human feedback on top of it uh, to make sure that you know, we have a representative sample there. I think it, it's important at all levels. Um, Lots of reasons I'm excited to be here. I always love speaking at universities, but one of them is like, please apply to OpenAI. Um, you know, we'd love to recruit you. That's, 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 that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh. Well, uh, if, if I can pr uh, push on this a little bit more, because I see uh, lots of students were, uh, were, 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 were smiling and reacting. 
we are at a university and we are at, at, at Howard University. We have an incredible talent here. Um, what advice do you have for, for our students who may want to get in to the industry, may work for, uh, uh, for, for OpenAI, work for other uh, companies? What, what is it that, that they can do uh, to, to kind of prepare? Um, just before this, I got to record the HUTU podcast, a little segment for it. And I'll, I'll say the thing I said there, because uh, I was really happy with the answer. I think this is, I think this is probably the greatest time, um, at, t at least since the internet, uh, to be graduating, to be you know, a young person. If you're interested in entering the technology industry, this is a very special opportunity uh, that probably won't come along again for a while. You all got very, very lucky. Um, But it's at, it's at the birth of a new industry and at a time of tremendous change when young people have the most advantage and the most opportunity. Um, you all are way more familiar with AI tools than people older than you. You bring a new set of fresh perspectives about not only how to do existing things, but how to, what can be created now, what just wasn't possible before this. Uh, there's a reason that I think young people drive a lot of the technological revolutions. You know, in my previous job at Y Combinator, this was obvious to us, but it's a really big deal and it's a really special opportunity. Uh, in addition to that perspective, you also will be entering, uh, entering your careers at a time of unbelievable change and turmoil. And, you know, that's when the advantage accrues to people who are just starting out. Uh, or earlier on, that's, that's awesome. Like when the ground is shaking is when all of the rules change and when the existing sort of power structures and order are under threat or weakened or whatever, and you have an opportunity to just come start something entirely new. That can be a new company, that can be a new kind of creative work, that can just be like doing a job at an existing company in a way that people 10 or 20 years older than you won't be as fluent at and won't have the creative spark for. So um, this is the first time uh, I have ever m missed being an investor. I don't miss it that much because uh, making AI is much more fun, but the opportunities to start new companies and, 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 and the, the new set of companies that'll be birthed right at the beginning of a new technological revolution, this is a period like the beginning of the internet revolution when you know, Amazon and Google and others were started or like the mobile revolution when all those companies were started that the big new companies get started right at the beginning of a new massive technological shift. And if I can just piggyback on that too, are those opportunities equal at this particular fertile moment for students from underrepresented backgrounds? What's your take on that? Yeah. Um, one of the many reasons works, by the way, on the earlier answer, I forgot to say again, you also can come out and do a very exciting impact at OpenAI. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, one, one of the things that's been exciting to us about this technological, this particular revolution, is the degree to which underrepresented communities have embraced it, uh, are leading the charge with the new tools, are building new products and services with the new tools. Um, and, and we're very optimistic from what we're seeing so far that this will be a much more representative new step. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'd like to just uh, pig, piggyback for a moment on what you said um, to, the, to your answer to the, to the previous uh, question. And, and, and that is, uh, as the provost indicated, we just launched a uh, master's program in data science here. And, and, and the emphasis of that, what we set it up is that we want to make sure that we do an excellent job in grounding the students, uh, the graduates, in the technical as aspects of what they need to know and what they need, the tools they need to use. But in addition to that, um, we, uh, I'd like to get you a comment on this. In addition to that, we like to do what we refer to as future-proofing their career. Yeah. And, and, and by that, I, I mean uh, give them the creative thinking and, and critical skills, critical thinking skills that, that will be needed uh, no matter what the tool is because tools change, yep. they evolve, but those uh, 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 innate creative critical thinking skills will always be needed. And that's the way of, of future-proofing your career. So uh, what do you think about, about that? Strong agree with that. Uh, I think critical thinking, creativity, the ability to figure out what other people want 
the ability to have new ideas, that, in some sense, that, that'll be the most valuable skill of the future. If you think of a world where every one of us has a whole company worth of AI assistants that are doing tasks for us to help us express our vision and um, make things for other people and make these new things in the world, the most important thing then will be the quality of the ideas, um, the curation of the ideas, because AI can generate lots of great ideas, but you still need a human there to say this is the thing other people want. And also, humans, I think, really care about the human behind something. So when I read a, bo a book that I really love, the first thing I want to do is go read about that author. And if an AI wrote that book, uh, I think I'll somehow connect to it much less. Same thing when I look at a great piece of art, or if I am using some company's product, I want to know about the people that, that created that. So I think in both directions of humans knowing what other humans want and also humans caring about the humans behind something, um, this will be, that'll be a super important skill. Uh, and so I think learning that ability to create, come up with new ideas, choose ideas from among the many options presented by an AI, uh, that'll be very valuable. I agree with you the tools will change, but I also think familiarity with the tools of today and this new way of using computers is really important. And that'll be important for everyone, not just the tool builders, but everybody, like in the same way that if you can't use a mobile phone, you're kind of at a huge disadvantage, but they're not that hard to use and people learn, but the earlier in your career you got familiar with it, the earlier in life, the better. You know, everybody in this room was familiar with it probably as long as you can remember. But uh, I, rem I remember watching older people struggle with getting comfortable with a phone for the first time, as intuitive as I thought they were. Uh, I think, it, I, I think human adaptability is remarkable. And so I'm very happy that people no longer think it's weird or impressive that we can talk to a computer like we talk to a human and it understands us and it talks back to us and it does things for us. But two years ago, almost no one believed that was gonna be possible anytime soon. You know, two years ago, what happens now with using ChatGPT was the stuff of sci-fi at best. And if you told the world this was going to be part of people's daily lives two years later, I think they would have said, of course not. You know, that's, that's a Hollywood thing. And this is a significant change the world has just gone through. Um, I think this is probably, well, certainly this is the most significant change to how we use computers since the touch screens on mobile phones. Um, but I think it'll probably be much, much bigger than that. You'll be able to just say it, tell a computer, like you would tell a friend or an employee, I need this thing to happen, or what do you think about this, or can you help me out with this, or how do you think about this? And it'll just do it for increasingly complex definitions of it. You know, right now it can maybe like write some code for you, edit a paper for you, uh, you know, help you analyze things, but someday it'll write a whole program for you, uh, do a whole research project for you, help you come up with new ideas, uh, someday not in the far future. So I think this is a very big deal. Yeah. If I could just follow up. Uh, 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 last week, I was at a international conference on biocomputing. And discussions of ChatGPT chat occupied a, a fair amount of discussion at that, at that uh, meeting. And there came a time when someone asked the question, relative to ChatGPT, where are we? In, as, as a society, and almost to a person, it was believed that we are at a transformative time. Yeah. We are at a transformative time, not necessarily because of the technical genius that's in ChatGPT, but it's transformative because it's so easy for everyone to use whether you're a STEM person or a humanities person, you're a housewife, or whether you're a middle schooler. And, 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 and so uh, I'll follow up with you on, on that, is, is that, is that it is seen, at least the people in, at that conference, they were all professional research investigators. And they were, to the person, said this, this is a, we had a transformative moment, almost like when the internet was, was interesting. To, to do this. Would you want to comment on that? One of, so I'll answer it in two parts. First of all, uh, I agree about the magnitude of this transformation because what is happening is we are going from a world in which intelligence is limited and expensive to abundant and cheap. 
And if you think about how much any of you could do if you had a massive amount of cognitive labor at your disposal to build the ideas you want to see happen, to be useful to other people, to provide services and advice, um, you know, right now you can hire people and you can coordinate them and it's kind of difficult and very expensive and most people in the world cannot afford nearly as much, let's call it cognitive service, as they'd like. Um, you know, not many people can afford great lawyers, for example. That's a very specialized, very expensive kind of cognitive service. If the cost of that, the availability of that, comes down by a factor of 100 or a factor of 10,000, and not just for legal advice, because I don't think anyone needs like lots more legal back and forth, but for all the stuff we do want, great entertainment, great products and services, everything else, great education, great medical care, uh, that is a profound shift to the world. So we're super excited about that, and I think that everyone can feel what the magnitude of that transformation looks like. Your second point is actually not a question that I've been asked many times, and I think it's a great one, so I appreciate it. Um, one of the things that I learned at YC, uh, Y Common Air, and also what I learned as I was like a kid studying the history of technology, is you can never go too far making a technology easy to use and accessible. Um, every, you know, every like 10% easier to use, you can make a technology, maybe twice as many people use it, or they use it twice as much, or there's this huge thing. And so we had this technology that we knew was pretty cool. We didn't know quite how much people were going to like it, but we had a sense they were. And we put it out first in an API, and like some nerds had a good time with it, but not very many. And it was kind of like unknown in the world. We put, we put GPT-3 out in the API. I think it was in like June, maybe it was July of 2020, 2020 something like that. Uh, and, you know, people built stuff and other, but we started thinking then about like, what is, what is the best, simplest, most natural user interface that we can build on this? And I'd had this observation that computers had trended over time um, to be as close to the way we interact with other humans or we interact with, with our physical world as, as possible. So you started out with like punch cards to program computers. I don't know how those people did it. It sounds amazing to me. Like what an unnatural way to use a computer. And they're like literally like sorting these things out on the floor, wild. But they did it. And then you had command lines and that was like a little better. There's somewhat of like a kind of framework I can see for that, but I'm grateful I never really had to use those computers. And then you have the graphical user interface. And now finally we're getting something towards more like something the way we interact with the world. Uh, and a lot of people started to use it. And we knew how to point at things and the mouse was a reasonable analog for that. The keyboard was kind of fake, but it was like good enough. And this idea that we had these like windows and graphical information displayed to us, like we look at the world, we look at a screen, there were images, that all kind of worked. Uh, the smartphone was then a, a huge revolution we got to get rid of that keyboard and that mouse and just use our hands, like again, much closer to how we use the world. And so we were thinking about what was next in that, and sci-fi had predicted this, so it shouldn't have taken us as long to figure it out as it did, but you really just want a computer you can talk to like you talk to a human. We, have, we are so finely tuned to use language and this, the, the, the nuance and sophistication of language. Um, imprecise though it is, all of the problems with it that it has, we can communicate at a very high bandwidth enormously complex ideas with language. And so we said, well, what if we just go back to this idea of chatbots? People tried it earlier. The problem was the chatbot didn't really understand you. Maybe now it can. Let's try to build that. And then building the chatbot itself, the chat interface itself, is obviously trivial. But the question was, how do we tune the underlying model to be really helpful to you and really good at conversation? Well, I, I think we should um, move soon to questions, but I, I do want to uh, pose maybe one final uh, reflection on, from, from this side of the fire, fireside chat. And that, uh, it's kind of a two-parter. Uh, in this world that you're describing and as the technology drives towards this change and uh, as um, we get those devices that are more like humans to talk with, is there something we lose of ourselves? And I, I, this is in the back, uh, I read this book recently, I Human, um, uh, and uh, it raises this question. 
do we lose something of ourselves as we advance, as we gain? And then secondly, uh, kind of behind all of this are the algorithms, of course. Um, and we, uh, as an institution, have been wrestling with um, the criticisms of bias that, that, are, that are in these algorithms. And so I was wondering if you could talk to, to both of those questions and then we'll, we'll open it up. We, we are, we are going to lose something. I mean, that's for sure. That happens with every technological revolution. And even though I'm confident we're going to gain much more than we lose, it doesn't mean we're not losing something and we're all loss of for good reason. Um, I'll tell you what I think we're not going to lose, which is I think we are not going to lose two things. The, the value and depth of human relationships, how much we care about other humans. Uh, I think people get excited to talk to AI friends for a while, and that'll be part of the future for sure. But you hear people who do that a lot say, man, there's really something about knowing this another human. And this is like deeply biologically wired in us, and I don't think going anywhere. Um, we're gonna, we are, we are so, yeah, so deeply wired to care about other humans, what other, per, other humans think, what other humans do the connection we have with other humans, we're not going to lose that. Um, we're also not going to lose our creative spark, um, our desire to be useful to each other, our desire to be fulfilled. The jobs of the future will look quite different than the jobs of today. I think of that we can be sure. But there will be jobs. We will find new things to do. And I hope that those future jobs, if we could know what they were today, we would say, that is so trivial, it's so stupid, such an indulgence. Those people are like way too rich, way too coddled, they're wasting their time. They don't know what it was like when we had to do real work. Um, I hope that happens. Like that is the way that I think human progress should go. Uh, but you know, we never, stop, we never stop creating, we never stop working, we never stop providing value to each other. Uh, we never stop our silly status games. On the questions of um, bias and algorithms, yeah, there exists bias at every level, at the algorithms, at the data sets, at the way we dis set the spec for the way these models should behave, the way that people create these, these labels for them. And I think we can measure that, um, we can evaluate it, and we can talk about those results as they go, and it needs to get better every time. But as these models become more sophisticated uh, and more integrated throughout all of society, the bias will become um, more nuanced and more important and it'll take great attention to keep it in check. Sam, before we go quickly to our questions, and there are microphones up front so you can begin to make your way up, are we gonna have an AI shrink? <laughs> <laughs> um, what we'll have it for sure is a, uh, wow, <laughs> that's gonna be tough. I will we'll rapid fire. let our students know we've got about seven minutes, but we, we'll, we'll try to get in what we can. Um, uh, let me skip that question let's then skip so we it. go to this. Let's go straight to questions. <laughs> Uh, if you could quickly identify yourself as you, as you give your question. Okay. Hello, I'm Camila Armas. I'm a freshman political science major from Raleigh, North Carolina, and I'm a part of the inaugural cohort of the Humanities and Social Sciences Scholars Program. My question is, with the recent boom of AI technology, many privacy concerns have been raised regarding the fact that much of the data that fuels this technology comes from sources who did not give consent to be used in these programs and who are not credited when used by the programs. Were you aware of these concerns during the creation of OpenAI and ChatGBT? And are there any measures being taken currently to address these privacy concerns? Thank you. Do you sorry, a follow-up. I, I can talk about either, but in the interest of time, more helpful if I focus on the privacy concerns or the intellectual property concerns? Uh, let's say intellectual property concerns. Okay. So, you know, th these models are uh, learning from what they train on, but they're not memorizing it. And also we think it's very important as like a principle of intellectual property uh, that we shouldn't regurgitate content to the greatest degree that we can. It'll be hard to be perfect at this because, you know, there could be like a Wall Street Journal article that's replicated somewhere else on the internet and not cited as a Wall Street Journal article. And uh, again, even though these models are trying to learn, they can inadvertently memorize pieces in some cases. So what we want to do is build technology to make sure that when these models are giving you output, they're not infringing on intellectual property rights. And also that we find ways to compensate IP holders in, with new revenue streams. Uh, we've started doing licensing deals with a lot of news organizations, for example, or a lot of scientific publishers. And uh, you know, I think everyone's excited about the new revenue stream that this can present. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, so I'm Dwayne Dixon. I'm actually a current PhD candidate here at Howard University in the math department. 
um, instructor also. I teach mathematics for machine learning, but it's a directed reading course. Um, not exactly sure why we are not actually advertising that. Um, these young men actually are my former Cal 2 students. That's how they learned about it, is actually still full of that. I'm also the AI curriculum instructor for in development for the Howard Math Middle School, um, which I developed the partnership. Um, but the problem is it's been on campus for a very long time. Um, and the partnership developed through uh, Howard Science Student Chapter, which was developed this past semester. Um, these are active students as well. So um, that is open to everyone, not just the applied mathematics. That's computer science majors, engineering, et cetera. Um, my situation is what um, are we going to do as Howard? Because your platform is amazing. I love it. I've already created about six or seven uh, GPTs that actually the students can use, but how are we? Because I understand we have to be on the back end of the actual mathematical piece of it to drop these biased columns, right? You don't know that if we're not in the background, right? So how can we feed those people into their industry? Because this is something that's just now popping up and we're always behind. So on the Howard piece, we'll be in touch. Um, thank you. That's a good question, though, right? Oh, it's an excellent question. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, um. Yeah, just as an engineering student currently, um, I know that we would love to see more specialized programs, especially in machine learning. I was just wondering if OpenAI is actually doing anything to kind of reach out to uh, more marginalized um, institutions to get students involved in AI? Yeah, I've, we, have, uh, we, we have a number of programs, but the one I'll highlight is our residence program. Um, we will uh, train you to be good at AI. Uh, we hope you'll maybe want to stay at OpenAI after. Most people usually do, but you certainly don't have to. Um, it's for people from engineering backgrounds other than AI. Uh, and yeah, we'll train you to be an AI researcher and AI engineer. Hi, my name is Darian Unger. I'm a professor uh, of innovation in the School of Business here at Howard University. And thank you for being here. Thank you for hearing our voices here. And, and hopefully, thank you for bringing in some of my students. Um, you, we are in the very early baby stages of AI. And, and um, many of the first movers in the internet age are, are no longer leaders. Right? Uh, I was wondering how you see uh, uh, open AI as different, as the, you're the, comp the competitive landscape as different uh, from, from, say, the 1990s when, you know, you, you cited Google, right? Before Google, there was Mosaic, right? And so I wanted to ask how you set yourself apart and, and chart a future for open AI that will last 20 years, 30 years, longer. It's a great question. I think about it all of the time. Um, I... It has evidently been hard for the human feedback where we take the base model and get it to behave in a certain way. And that requires both deciding how it should behave uh, and then getting people to sort of say, this is a good response, this is not a good response, or this, you know, this fits the specification and this doesn't. And having diverse representation at all of those steps uh, is very important. And also figuring out and agreeing as a society on what the behavior should be. I know I've mentioned this a few times, but it's such a big challenge. Getting that right requires such a diverse input of voices to do it. Um, I think that'll be critical to the field going forward. OK, thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. My, I'm, my name is Keaton. I'm a sophomore computer science major here. And my question is actually tended towards AGI, because um, the future after AI uh, indefinitely will become AGI and how artificial intelligence has emotions or be able to learn from itself and you know that's where the potential risks come in with you know um ai actually having emotions i've been able to like well the risks potentially so i'm going to ask where open ai is at in terms of agi and how do you plan on balancing out the risks and benefits thanks for the question it's uh you know that is probably the thing we think the most about um i i think agi is now like a such a fuzzy term and people use it in so many different ways 
What you're asking about, I think, is closer to what I would call like super intelligence. Not something that can do the jobs that a human can do, but, but say something that can do research, do AI research itself, maybe as well as all of OpenAI's researchers, and use that to self-improve. Um, and how we think about what the world will look like when we get to that level, and how we make sure we confront the risk of such a system, um, which are very hard to do. We have new teams that help us think about being prepared for that world, also technical safety work to think about how we can make sure humans stay in control of systems that are more capable than we are. I think it's somehow both going to be stranger than it seems and also in some other way much more continuous and much more like the world of today. Humans will still be in control, but what any human can do and certainly what any group of humans or nation can do will be like vastly, vastly improved. And Part of the reason that we try to talk about this, even though it scares people or they think we're crazy or both, is if we're right, this is a huge deal and really important. It's going to impact all of us in a huge way. And we want the world to have this conversation now. Like, we know that ChatGPT isn't that powerful. We know if it was just going to be ChatGPT, none of these things really matter. But given this, the steepness of the curve that we're on of the exponential, um, we want the world to have this conversation. So we jointly decide how to balance those risks and benefits. Thank you. Just to ask, how close do you think you are, though, to like achieving all that? Um, it's super hard to say. I hesitate to give. I, I'm like always happy to make predictions about what will happen, but when in research in particular is super hard. But I would say that like in this decade, we get to very powerful systems. I personally don't believe towards that like thing that can do is re AI research as well as open AI, but I've been wrong before. Um, but I would say, like, very powerful systems that a lot of people will say, like, okay, for what I want to call AGI, this is a version of it, an early version, by the end of this decade. That would be my guess, but could be much longer. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sierra Williamson. I'm a junior honors management major, Africana Studies minor from Melbourne, Australia. And my question is, how does OpenAI plan to protect and support the mental health of workers, human workers, who must label and scrub toxic or violent content from OpenAI systems, particularly because this work is done by, or often done by communities of color? Uh, great question. So obviously provide lots of counseling and support to people. Um, we've learned more about how this works and we're trying to do more of it in source with our own team members as much as we can, and we can more control the support we provide. But the best thing I think we can do is start using these AI tools themselves to make sure that humans don't have to look at the worst of the content or interact with the worst of the content. And tools that, like, tools that can help humans have a better and easier experience while having the same or more impact, I think is a new thing that we can do for the people who are providing this feedback. Thank you. Hi, my name is Abdul Nafi. I'm a freshman computer science major here. Um, so my question would be, if I think about the negative implications of AI, one that comes to my mind is deep fakes and online impersonation of people. So how do you think the industry as a whole can sort of mitigate that problem? There's two different directions I can imagine that coming from. Um, one is when people say something themselves or when they endorse a particular image, there's like a cryptographic signature other people can verify. And you say, this really is a picture I took, or this really is a quote I said. Um, and we, as a society, decide that you know, we're just flooded with generated media. And back to that point about humans caring about other humans, we're going like to have these networks of trust. And we'll say, all right, you know what? If you didn't sign that photo, I'm going to assume it's not real. Um, and if someone didn't sign it that I trust, that I trust, that I trust, and I don't have that chain, I'm going to assume it's not real. So that could happen. Um, the other thing that could happen is that we have enough rules in place on the powerful AI systems that exist that there's a watermarking process that everybody kind of enforces. Um, but with, e with either of those paths, there will be a huge amount of generated content on the internet. And I think society is just very quickly going to evolve to understand, not to take it too seriously. Uh, before we take another question, I want to make sure you're okay taking a couple more questions. Sure. Okay. That's five minutes. Yep, great. Uh, hello, I'm Alex Blocko, sophomore political science major from Columbia, South Carolina. And my question is, what role or initiatives do you think 
open AI and AI will play in enhancing collaborative uh, education and the way that humans will end up learning in the future with AI. It is one of the few areas that we're the most excited about. Um, students and teachers were the first like massive adopters of open AI, of ChatGPT, and have continued to surprise us at every step of the way with what they're doing uh, and how much of an impact it's already having on education. In fact, very few students pay for GPT-4, so most of them are just using the free version and still seeing all of these positive results. Um, some of the GPTs that launched in the store a couple days ago, I think it was, uh, are great educational experiences. But we can see a path to a world where every student gets a great AI personalized tutor, and that will transform how they learn. Uh, you'll still need human teachers for sure uh, in, to provide much of the support, but the amplification this can have on what a teacher can do, I hope we get to a world where every college student starting you know, 18 years from now is smarter than any of you freshmen here in this room. Like, I think that'd be a great triumph. Thank you, uh, thank you for your time. Uh, Reverend Vince Van, I uh, come from the School of Divinity. Uh, as well as the, I'm <clears throat> sorry, as well as the Religious Affairs Chair for the NAACP DC chapter. Uh, my question is, uh, so 15 years from now, uh, we're gonna see young people trust AI more than they trust any other thing, right? Uh, and the tough part is in places like Florida, we know that certain uh, uh, books and even history from, from a black lens is being removed. So what is the work that's being done? Are you all looking to engage with um, historical uh, black institutions regarding the information that's gonna be on? Um, but also uh, theological spaces. So for instance, I use chat as well, but there's moments where you, you ask a question about you know, slavery or a text in the scripture, um, and there's a reference to say, you know, make them think about the lens of the time period, and it kind of softens the reality of what actually happened. Um, so my, my question is if we're removing actual history from other places, and young people in 15, 20 years from now are gonna trust chat B GBT, how do we trust that your company is going to do the work to engage with those historical black institutions to make sure 15, 20 years from now that accurate information is on um, open AI. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about that. <laughs> I mean, th th this is like a big part of why we try to get out into the world and talk to people that are not the people in SF every day. Um, we have got to figure out a way that what gets encoded into these models, not just the knowledge, but the culture and the context and how things get explained, brings this diverse perspective of the whole world into it. Um, so if there's areas we're missing the mark there now, we'd love to like talk about those. But more than that, we'd love the input on the principles going forward and how to set up a reliable process to make this work. Um, I, one of my like sayings to people is better every rep. Like we, the way, I believe that contact with reality um, and putting this out and getting hundreds of millions of people to use it and tell us what's good and what's bad, what works and what doesn't is the only way to make it better. So we, we make the thing as good as we know how to do with as much input and, as we have at the time and as much kind of compute and data resources we have at the time. We build something, we put it out, people make a comment like that, we go think like, all right, we gotta figure out how to get better at this. That's how we do it. But before the provost is uh, giving us the signal, uh, I, I want to take you up on your, um, your offer. People have to get out of SF. Uh, we've got a lot more questions. Uh, we, could, we could continue this conversation all day. Uh, we'd like to invite you back uh, at, at a future point uh, to continue the conversation with Howard. And we, we know that Mr. Altman has a hard stop, and, and there are a number of uh, additional questions, but we, we wanted to honor our commitment to him. Uh, but <laughs> maybe we can use AI to create more time. <laughs> but I certainly want to, to offer our thanks and appreciation to uh, Mr. Sam Altman, to President uh, Vincent, and to, uh, to Dr. Sutherland. And to his point, uh, we certainly want to be, um, as Howard University, a convening space where these types of important conversations take place. And I know we have a colleague here from Microsoft and we have a commitment, we have a commitment, that we're going to have other industry leaders in, in AI be a part of this conversation with our students and with our faculty and, and staff. And I was also reminded by a colleague from Fine Arts that uh, we should be mindful that artificial intelligence and chat GPT 
is not just a function of technology and, and technology disciplines. It's, it's increasingly used and important in the fine arts and the humanities, uh, in the social sciences, and as an institution, what we want to make sure that we are doing is that we are providing the space where our social scientists, our experts in humanities, our experts in fine arts, have access to this technology, have access to data science, have access to AI, so we can answer the broader societal questions that we need to answer regarding healthcare disparities, regarding socioeconomic disparities, regarding criminal justice reform, and that's who Howard has been, and that's who we're going to continue to be. So please join me in thanking our panel. For the And I, I also want to thank our students. Those were excellent questions. Uh, just <laughs> further highlights the, the talent that is available here at Howard. And uh, I, I would invite our students to take Mr. Altman up on his offer that they're looking to hire uh, more students from, from Howard and other students of, of color. And so we want to continue to make sure that we're providing that opportunity as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your questions, and we look forward to the next opportunity to have a session of this type. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.